I basically have always uh, been one who enjoyed putting things together. I was one of those old erector set guys. I like to put things together. I like to build. Uh, I like the idea of uh, uh, seeing uh, uh, what one conceives uh, in the mind uh, actually coming to manifestation in terms of uh, an actual finished product. Um, and so um, the interest in construction, the interest in architecture in particular, the idea of drawing it and then um, conceiving it, drawing it, uh, coming up with how it will look and then actually overseeing the process of it coming into being is, is one that has always been of interest to me. My first inclination was to uh, be in uh, the field of law. My father had a long history of uh, public service and I have been blessed to follow in his footsteps. Uh, my father was the first African American in the state of Tennessee to run for the state legislature since Reconstruction. He ran in 1959 and he lost. But because of his voter registration efforts and those of the Shelby County Democratic uh, Club, uh, two years later, A.W. Willis uh, was elected as the first African American to serve in the state legislature in Tennessee since Reconstruction. He won in 1959. There is a famous portrait that was done by Ernest Withers of those lawyers. And in that portrait, you see uh, Ben Hooks, you see uh, A.W. Willis, you see H.T. Lockhart, you see Russell Sugarman, you see my dad, you see uh, A.A. A. Ladin, you see. Uh, ben Jones, and those were the seven lawyers who at that time uh, defended uh, uh, the civil rights demonstrators when they sat in at the library, the lunch counters. Uh, all of those uh, uh, African American attorneys have gone on and went on to do tremendously great things uh, in Memphis and indeed in many instances affecting the entire nation. And my mother was a teacher here in uh, Memphis and Shelby County. She taught at uh, Magnolia Elementary School uh, for 33 years. I lived in a neighborhood, Castalia Heights, which was rough. We lived on Castalia, and of course, in uh, the era that uh, we lived uh, in those locations. Um, you know, Memphis was a very segregated community. Um, Memphis uh, was uh, an area where you had uh, professionals living next to blue collar workers. Uh, uh, if you were African American, there were only so many areas that you could live in. I think in many respects, uh, part of the problems that we face today is that uh, so many of those who have the means have moved away from those who don't have the means, and there's not the, uh, the uh, sort of uh, interaction that occurred uh, when, uh, because of segregation, we all lived in similar areas. Growing up in in the neighborhood uh, where uh, we were professionals. Uh, there are people who will tell you right now that uh, uh, they went to law school because of my father uh, and seeing him in the neighborhood and uh, growing up. And they've become lawyers, uh, not only when we lived over in Castalia, but also when we moved over on Gold by Hamilton. Uh, and that, again, was a, another function of of segregation because on that little circle where we lived we had pastors and teachers and lawyers and college professors and people who worked at uh, John Morrell meatpacking plant and auto mechanics and contractors and uh, all in that one circle and uh, the beauty of it is that uh, the son of the auto mechanic uh, saw my dad and is now going to law school um, I saw the contractor and loved using my hands, and so I, I ended up being in housing and construction and planning. Um, you know, uh, there were plenty of teachers, and uh, many of uh, uh, the young people have gone on to teach. So, in many regards, the circumstances of segregation actually resulted in a sense of community that, that to some degree, was weakened and. Uh, uh, has reduced the positive role models for those who may not have them in any other way. I was a sophomore at Hamilton High School, if my memory is correct, in 1968. 
And uh, when Dr. King uh, came to Memphis, uh, I remember that um, um, the original march, uh, which turned violent, actually had some of its beginnings at Hamilton and some other schools, where some of the teenagers um, uh, influenced to some degree by groups, uh, the invaders and others that were active at that time, uh, actually were uh, very, very, very uh, upset about um, uh, what was transpiring in the city. Uh, I did not participate in the march uh, that uh, Dr. King had originally uh, because my dad uh, basically had the suspicion that it was going to turn violent and he basically wouldn't let me in. Uh, I was not quite at the point where I was willing to, to uh, uh, disobey him. But subsequent to Dr. King's coming here, um, I remember uh, the National Guard being here. I remember um, the speech at uh, uh, Mason Temple. Uh, I remember uh, the uh, city immediately after the assassination. And part of that recollection that I have is an interesting one because I was a paper boy for the Commercial Appeal. And uh, I actually was out on the street throwing papers during the curfew that was imposed uh, on, uh, in Memphis after Dr. King's death. And I was actually confronted by National Guardsmen in bayonets about violating the curfew. Uh, and of course, uh, it was obvious to anyone who saw me that I had two paper sacks and that's what I was doing. And, uh, but it left an impression on me that uh, you know, here are these men with bayonets uh, literally uh, acting in a manner that is somewhat threatening to a 16-year-old uh, boy uh, who is trying to disseminate information in the community. I also had the pleasure of being a part of the Youth Advisory Council to the Memphis Juvenile Court, which the then Judge Kenneth Turner had established. I was the uh, vice president of that group, and that was made up of uh, young people from high schools throughout Memphis that he brought together to talk about what was going on and to try to sort of begin some bridge building and to try to uh, address some of the issues facing uh, juveniles in the city. And one of the greatest revelations that I think I had uh, and have had in my lifetime was when this group met sort of, uh, I guess, a month or so after the death of Dr. King. We were discussing what had transpired. Uh, I was with some of my uh, uh, white uh, fellow participants in the program, and they revealed that they never, they went to the movies, they went shopping, they never had a curfew. We were supposed to have a dust to dawn curfew, but the dust to dawn curfew only applied to one area of the city, my area of the city. Uh, as time has progressed, uh, I've come to realize that uh, more than most, I have sort of been blessed to have been uh, able to live in an era where we could only go to the zoo. I'm saying we, African Americans in Memphis, could only go to the zoo one day a week, had to drink out of colored water fountains, uh, could not uh, uh, do certain things. Uh, and I went from that as a young child to being able, because of Dr. King's death and some of the changes that were wrought uh, in uh, our country, to being able to go to Dartmouth College uh, as one of the first wave of those students that were admitted uh, after Dr. King's death, to then being a beneficiary of the Voting Rights Act and the voting process by ultimately being able to be an elected official here in Memphis and Shelby County. Uh, so the period of time that I sort of have lived through has brought me from being a child of segregation to being uh, basically a man of uh, a changed America. Uh, and uh, it, it's happened literally in my lifetime.
because not everyone has that perspective. Uh, a lot of our young people today never lived through the segregation period and so don't really have that as a frame of reference. Uh, by the same token, a lot of those who obviously lived in segregation uh, were not blessed uh, to be able to take advantage of the new windows of opportunity that opened as a result of the Civil Rights Movement and Dr. King's death. Uh, and yet, uh, I as an individual have been able to basically be a part of all of that.